All right, you guys have made it to the very last session. Congratulations. In this uh, session, we're just going to cover some terms, concepts, things of that nature, and just do a quick wrap-up. So I thank you for hanging out with me, and um, hopefully it, this, uh, these sessions have been very helpful to you, um, and you're able to... If you haven't already, you get your outline ready to start studying and it gives you an idea of things that you need to research and look for and kind of just review. Before we go on into the terms, it's probably very important to, turn, to point out, um, I don't know if many, and I'm going through my notes, to pull up the topic, yes, of what I wanted to discuss. If, and hopefully many of them have updated their information on the DSM because a lot of information, including my own, that I had to remember to update, um, is talking about the DSM-4. A lot of them still contain information on that. And I can't be 100% sure that the CRC exam, hopefully it has, because the DSM-5 probably has been out long enough for them to update some information on their exam to include things from there. But just in case, I thought maybe it was important to not only have information on 4, but on 5. 4, just in case they still have some questions, maybe even comparing the two, because there are some significant differences between four and five. So you want to still be familiar with what was included in the DSM-4, but also probably those changes on five. And what I will remember to do is send my sheet. I kind of have a um, sheet that goes over the major changes that happened in five and kind of how they're listed in there and then that way you can just read through those and add them to your notes um, that you probably already have and you can still keep information on DSM-4 as a backup and as a just in case. So let's kind of go through um, not only the and let me not forget the ICDX we'll also talk a little bit about that as well but the big thing here is the DSM-4 and 5 um, APA, American Psychiatric Association, created its own diagnostic manual a long, long time ago because earlier versions of the ICD, before it became the ICDX, were not adequately descriptive enough for classifying mental conditions in America. The ICD covers uh, all medical conditions and diseases and is how they are usually reported to insurance companies. So that's why it's important here in this context because they are used uh, through those companies and by international treaty how nations report diseases statistics to WHO, which is the World Health Organization. So it's important to know what the ICDX uh, has and what it is, but usually on the CRC exam they have questions that pertain to the DSM. So just wanted to you give you a, a, a FYI on the ICD and ICDX. Now in relation to psychiatric disabilities, the ICDX is a very much improved over the ICD-9, which I keep saying X-10, I'm sorry, 10, I'm looking at the X and not thinking in Roman numerals 10. It's a very much improvement over 9. Um, and in future years, according to many um, researchers, there may not be a need for separate manuals between the ICD-10 and the DSM-5. But for now, both are used. And the DSM-5 is more widely used. Again, the ICD-10 is used more by um, insurance companies and again um, other health organizations like the World Health Organization but by clinicians the DSM-5 is more widely used and that's most likely why the DSM is referenced in the CRC exam and not the ICD-10. 
again please excuse me for using X it's the last session of the day so I may just be a little loopy now on the DSM 4 let's cover that first and what was in that so you're familiar and that way maybe you can better understand what is now in the DSM 5 the DSM 4 used five um, axes on which different information was reported. So let's go over that. On axis one, there were clinical disorders and other conditions. Axis two, personality disorders and mental retardation. Axis three, general medical condition. Axis four, psychosocial and environmental problems and then on axis five was a global assessment of functioning let's see um like axis two when we're talking about those personality disorders um they have paranoid personality disorders schizoid personality disorder uh antisocial personality disorder things of that nature um see. Axis 4 has psychosocial and environmental problems. Axis 5, this was again used for the global assessment functioning, which is called the GAF rating scale. It's a hypothetical continuum of mental health uh, to profound mental illness. So, those were the, how the DSM let me say that again. This is how the DSM-4 was structured. Now, how the DSM-5 is structured is quite different. And I'm going to pull that information up. The DSM-5 will have three sections, so not those axes. Section 1 will include an introduction and instruction how to use the new version. Section 2 covers the diagnostic categories. And Section 3 includes conditions that need additional research, a glossary of terms, and other important information. Some of the more important changes to the new DSM. No more of those multi-axle assessment systems. So we've already run over those that were in four. So remember in five, you will not have those anymore. The system was replaced in five with a more simplified documentation approach. Essentially, the first three axes were combined with separate notations for the other two former axes, covering psychosocial and environmental factors, as well as disability. Um, there are some new diagnoses in 5. You have disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Um, the addition of this diagnosis will hopefully reduce the number of children misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder. You have a hoarding disorder. That's very interesting. Serious hoarding behavior affects a significant percentage of the population previously regarded as a symptom or subtype of obsessive compulsive disorder, it will now be listed as a separate distinct disorder. It's very interesting. The primary symptom is the inability or persistent difficulty to discard or give up possessions regardless of their actual value. Then you have a binge eating disorder. Symptoms include regularly eating an unusually large amount of food in a discrete period of time. Now, the binge eating, um, this binge eating is not followed by an inappropriate attempt to compensate, like exercising or that excessive uh, ex uh, purging, and is commonly seen as bulimia nervosa or anorexia nervosa. So prior to the DSM-5, very important here, prior to the DSM-5, individuals with this binge eating pattern have been diagnosed with eating disorder NOS, which means not other, otherwise specified. Very interesting. There are some revised diagnoses 
and five autism spectrum disorder which is very huge and very important uh, in the disability community this is likely one of the most significant and controversial diagnostic changes in the DSM-5 it includes the disorders formerly known as autistic disorder Asperger's syndrome pervasive developmental disorder and childhood disintegrative disorder Post-traumatic stress disorder will now include four instead of just three distinct diagnostic clusters. Um, pedophilic or phylic, I may be mispronouncing that, disorder. Um, this will be the new name for the disorder formerly known as pedophilia. The diagnostic criteria remain the same. And some of these, you know, again, DSM-5 um, is still very new to a lot of us. And a lot of the things that are in 5, um, still many of us um, still need to do more research on. So um, I've been reading through it a lot more recently myself. Um, and uh, it's very interesting how things have changed. But... For me, I can relate it back to it being a cultural issue. And when we were discussing cultures in the earlier sessions, remember, it's dynamic. It's always evolving. So, and this is the DSM-5. It's, it's going to evolve based, again, on what? What is happening and what is going on in the world. So, even though, as it stated in one of the renaming, the um, artistic uh Autism spectrum disorder is controversial, can be controversial to change things that maybe people are so used to um, reading about and having, um, but when you're working with a cultural group, which are individuals with disability, things are going to change and evolve. So it's, it's very interesting how they are being uh, put in the various categories and why, but um, this is the manual that is most widely used. So here it is. Um, they have disorders requiring further research. Um, so it includes a section on that. Internet use gaming disorder, non-suicidal self-injury, and suicidal behavioral disorder. So um, this is two pages of information that I just kind of gathered hopefully put together well enough so that you can see the differences between the four and the five and I will make sure to uh, send that out to Miss McKissick so if you are interested in having it of course you can do your own research on it but it's just a reference sheet so that you can see the differences these are some of the major differences between four and five and again I'm not clear if the CRC exam is going to include just information on five. Um, so it, it would be a good idea to be knowledgeable about information in both of those. Okay, some important concepts and terms as we're closing out and coming to an end on our sessions um, is just going through, let me go back to my notes here. Um, some of the terms and words and phrases that you'll see used working in vocational rehab field, client-centered placement, just emphasizing teaching job-seeking skills so that the client or consumer can become largely independent. Because again, we're, we're going to be able to assist them with finding this job, but they're going to have to keep it and retain it. and. Um, do the job on their own so we want to make sure that we're focusing our, pl our placement again on that individual client transferable skills I think I've kind of worn um, that term or concept out but it is a very much needed and useful term in, in our area because of and in, just because an individual now maybe now has a disability and cannot do the job that they were previously doing or needs to adjust to the job that they are doing and maybe do it in a different manner, transferable skills becomes very important. 
supported employment again is placing those clients with those severe disabilities in competitive employment um, where they work under the oversight and assistance of as necessary as necessary with a job coach and again that's becoming even more and more important when working uh, with individuals with those severe developmental disabilities on the job evaluation you also may see this uh, t another term used interchangeably with it which is basically on the job training OJT is what we say a lot uh, in our office and that's just a work assessment approach where the client's performance on a real job is observed and evaluated and the council often come up with a contract with the employer to provide a service so that on the job evaluation or OJT on the job training as we refer to it would be where we would place a client in a job where we believe they would be successful but the employer is still maybe not there with us yet so we would place them there for a couple of months two or three months and we would pay for that client to be there so that the employer can see that this client can do the job because of course many employers still um, are not um, wanting are not wanting to hire an individual with disability they just are not sure how to accommodate a person with a disability and sometimes even honestly not even sure if they can do the job so a lot of times it takes us physically putting a client at the site and letting the employer see that this individual disability is no different uh, and how they're able to um, if they're able to do the job then a person without a disability it just may take some uh, accommodation or um, structuring the job in a way well where this person um, with this functional limitation or disability can do the job but they can still do it just as well as a person who does not have a disability so we use uh, OJT's a lot audiogram um, we just had a meeting on those we're working with individuals with a deaf and hard of hearing uh, we have to have that audiogram and uh, the different frequencies that we look for to be able to assist an individual with the hearing impairment. Um, quadriplegia, um, that's an impairment function of all four extremities, usually produced by a spinal cord lesion in C3 through T1 levels. And I didn't speak to this much in the sessions, but it would be very important for you to know about those spinal cord levels and to know what areas of the body that they affect because that ties into the type of impairments that they're going to have and what type of uh, functions they're going to have in different parts of the bodies and then in what type of jobs that they can do. So you can see how all of that ties together. So um, again, I had um, a separate section that just went through those, you know, those uh, C's and T's, those levels on the spinal cord, and talked about what areas of the body that they um, impaired. And so I can see if I still have that. Um, everyone didn't need it because some people already had their own uh, study material for that area, but I just had it as a just in case. So I can see if I can find it, or I'm sure that I can um, go out to the internet where it will list all of those, and you can do that as well. Just to become familiar with, because there are a lot of scenarios that reference spinal cord injuries. And so if you don't, if they say it affects the T6, and you don't know what area is it is on the, the T6 is on the body, and what... Um, what part of the body that it impairs then you're not going to be able to answer that scenario so it would be great for you to review those levels so I've already talked about in our wrap up what you should review um, what you should study basically the areas that I covered here in the study session are the major areas so those are the areas that you should definitely review I kind of talked to you about just, you know, being knowledgeable about uh, workman's comp. We went pretty well over all the laws that they would cover um, on the CRC exam. 
and those vocational acts and amendments and things of that nature and personality theories, counseling theories again counseling theories and the case management are the top two areas of where a lot of individuals who take the exam have weaknesses so those are the areas where I would really test myself and see where I need to study more um, I just mentioned those uh, levels on the spinal cord because there are quite a few scenarios on the exam um, so in those scenarios they will say Joe Blow has this disability and he wants to do this uh, be a cashier at night in a gas station you know what would you say to him well if you don't know what that disability is if you don't know if that's what that spinal cord injury is referencing um, to on their body you're going to be totally lost in that scenario so that's why I kind of went over some of those concepts in terms because it's important for you to know those conditions um, what certain terms mean and what they're referencing like job ready job placement things of that nature those terms are very important to know um, take a section at a time especially with the theories because they're so heavy um, as far as in every thing that they have um, involved with them and all the theorists and every and it can be overwhelming so I would definitely take the laws and maybe basic BR and study them for some time then study definitely case management by itself definitely the theories by themselves with nothing else because you have to be able to identify those and just have an overall overview knowledge of stats you know what again I um, stated earlier what nominal is ordinal interval ratio standard deviation things of that nature those major assessments know what they are know what they're um, trying to find in those assessments those there uh, there are questions about the standard deviation of those assessments and the mean and that's why I made sure to point those out um, and just make sure that you are giving yourself enough time to study the CRC exam is now offered three times a year um, in March July and October I believe but you can always go to the CRC Commission's website and get those dates but it used to be offered twice a year it's now offered three times a year I do know that so you have time to study don't wait until a month before that's not enough time to study for the exam I took the exam in October and I, I started studying for that exam in June July the end of June toward the beginning of July so I gave myself just about three months to study for the exam because if you just give yourself just that month before that is definitely not enough time and that's definitely where the anxiety can come in and you're rushing through terms and theories and other areas that really need to have some time and you need to have time to test yourself I can't emphasize that enough I'm a big person on testing yourself and seeing where you're at because some things you can kind of put to the side and you won't have to study as much and then that'll ease a lot of the anxiety that you have with taking the exam and just take a deep breath know that you studied and know that you're ready and do your best and you'll do well thank you for allowing me to be able to have this time with you and do these study sessions and I wish you well in, in all your future endeavors. Thank you.